Hey, beautiful friends. We are back with another episode of the Robin Graham show. And today we're going to talk about Pinterest. Oh my gosh, you guys, this episode is going to be fire because we're going to do some really fast talking. You may want to grab a pen and paper or just come back and re-listen to the episode later because there's going to be so much value here. I'm also going to encourage you, and I'll probably mention it during the show too, but in the show notes, there will also be a link to episode 160 with Rachel Ngom. And she talked about Pinterest and you may have other strategies there that you won't, that we won't touch on today, or there may be things here that we didn't touch on there. So it's always beneficial to listen to both episodes and have two different expert opinions that you can then apply to your own business. So without further ado, because I want to dive right in here and waste zero time, I'm going to bring Kate all to the Robin Graham show. Welcome. Hey, thanks so much for having me. I'm so happy that you're here because I love Pinterest. We are using it in my business and we see a lot of traffic coming to our website. Um, and it, to me, it is just something that simply makes sense. And every single person out there who has an online business or a coaching business or anything else should be using Pinterest to drive traffic. I think it's just an incredible marketing tool. But before we dive into that, Kate, will you just tell the listeners a little bit about you and how? How you got to the point in your career journey where you are today? Yeah. So I'm Kate all, I own simple pin media. We're a Pinterest marketing agency. I started in 2014, actually. Um, the, as the story goes, uh, I was really poor. I was working for a friend at the time who I was helping her with Facebook marketing. I was also helping her with affiliate marketing and Facebook had changed their algorithm. And so literally sitting at her kitchen table, I said, my husband doesn't have a job. We're living on food stamps overwhelmed. And she said, you should manage people's Pinterest pages. And I said, that's a dumb idea. She's like, well, you have no other options, so you should try. So I spent the last part of 2013, really figuring out how Pinterest worked for business owners, if it could work for management, and then took on a couple of clients in 2014 and they loved it. They thought it was amazing. And then it morphed from there into We've served at 1.130 clients, both on the organic and ads. We have a team of 35 and memberships and all of that, and really morphed into this Pinterest education space that we really want to be that best resource and source for Pinterest marketing information. So people can really, like you said, leverage it in a way for their business that helps them grow unlike any other platform out there. So that's the short story of how I got started. Oh my gosh. I love it. And I love that you took a a situation and completely transformed your life out of an idea and, (laughs) you know, like something so simple that seems so stupid, like, Oh my Mm -hmm. gosh, that could never work. I never want to do that. And then look where you are today. I mean, a team of 35 people, that's incredible. Yeah, it is incredible. It kind of rocks my world sometimes and scares me too. also having responsibility over that many people, but also gives me my greatest joy too, as well to watch other people use their gifts and talents in this space and really just truly live out what we want other businesses to be like successful and grow and all of those kinds of things. So yes, yeah, started as a very dumb idea, but I took the risk because I didn't have any other options and it's been a joy the whole time. It really, really has. It's been a great learning experience. Well, a couple of things there. Number one, you took risk. Number two, you made a decision. And I think so oftentimes when we're stuck in that place of desperation, almost like you were, you stay Mm. in a place of indecision because you're so fear, so fearful of what if that decision doesn't work? And what if I invest in this? And then we lose even more and, you know, so many things. So kudos to you that you did that. And then. Mm. What I love too about your story is the fact that you are a perfect example of creating that ripple effect of good in the world. Hmm. So you're now giving 35 other people the opportunity to have security and abundance within their lives that they may not have otherwise had. So I love it. All right. So let's dive into Pinterest. Okay. I need a dumb drum roll now. (laughs) Um, Okay. So I want to know, first of all, let's talk about strategy because I'm a strategy geek, but um, when we're thinking about our overarching marketing strategy, where does Pinterest fit in? 
Yeah. So we look at strategy for Pinterest is very much in the bucket of Google and YouTube. We think of it as a content element where people are approaching the platform, asking a question. They don't care about you. They care about their problem or seeking their benefit. Whereas we put Instagram and TikTok and Facebook in the bucket of they want to get to know you. They're interested Mm -hmm. in following you, learning more about you. So when we look at this whole scope, like I think of a bicycle wheel with spokes going out, we really put Pinterest on that side of you're identifying with cold users who are really, truly not interested in your brand yet. They're interested in what you have to offer. So you have to approach the platform completely differently because if you take what you know about Instagram and also how you feel when you market on Instagram, there's an element of like, you get comments, you get feelings, you get likes, you get engagement. It feels good sometimes to market on Instagram. It does not feel good sometimes to market on Pinterest. So you have to put it in the bucket of the long game. Google is a long game. YouTube is a long game. You settle in and say, I'm going to invest in this platform for one to two years. And all of those build like snowballs. You know, you're putting in this piece one piece at a time to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So that's the very first thing is we tell people understand where it fits And then understand your why. Why do you want to use it? Are you interested in driving traffic? Are you interested in growing your email list, making more sales of your products? When you have those two things mastered, then you can get into the tactics, which are variable at all times. You can adjust those. But knowing your why will help you when Pinterest feels very boring compared to the others. Mm, I love that. Okay. So now we know where it fits into our overall marketing strategy. And I like to use the, the idea that it's SEO. It's a search engine. It is not something that you're just going to for DIY ideas, right? Pinterest is actually a search engine, just like Mm -hmm. Google, just like YouTube. And I love that you emphasize that it's a long game because from what I understand, it can take like 90 days for a pin to actually gain traction. Yeah. Even longer sometimes six months, nine months. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Which doesn't like you're thinking right now, like, wow, I don't, it's a, I, you just don't know when somebody is going to put in the keyword terms to search for what you have. And when Pinterest is going to serve that up in front of them, and then they're going to be impacted by it. They're going to save it. Somebody else is going to see it. And then you, you just don't know when. So that's why there's a debate out there about deleting old pins that don't have engagement. We definitely tell people don't delete old Mm -hmm. pins because you just never know when they're going to be surfaced in the algorithm. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. That brings us to the strategy then. So it's a long game strategy. And you mentioned keywords and key phrases. So when we're planning out our Pinterest strategy, where do we begin? And like, how do we map that out effectively? Yeah. So let's go on the assumption that your profile is fully set up. It's optimized with uh, your business name. There are, you know, really clear definition of who you are in the description. You don't need to use your URL in the description because once you connect your hooks and handles and you become a business account that your URL is there. So I see a lot of people adding their URL to their description. You don't have to worry about that. Then you really need to go into the boards that you create. And that's the first place that keywords play a role because boards are, think of them like, like little silos of what your content is about. And so if you break that out and you say, I am talking about Pinterest marketing for e-commerce, Pinterest marketing for bloggers, how to help people sell more products on Pinterest, whatever it might be, then you can begin to start with that very succinct title, less than four words. And then you use keywords in the description And then you use keywords in the pin description. Now, where to find them? There's two places. One is you want to use the search bar on Pinterest. That will give you both keywords and phrases. And Pinterest ranks them very similar to Google. So if they pop up in their search prediction, you can safely assume that those are really great terms that is being searched. Now, if you put in a search term and nothing comes up, That really means that either, let's say in the weight loss category, if you're in that, Pinterest is very clear about uh, body positivity. So they're going to demote things like how to lose weight in 10 days. So obviously you don't want to use that and you don't see that there, right? The second place is a tool that Pinterest has called trends. It's trends.pinterest.com. 
this is a really great way to not only see the volume of searches throughout the year, but also what keywords are trending. They just changed this up about a month ago, six weeks ago. It looks totally new. You have to click around, look at different things, but you can break it out between US, UK, and Canada. So that really helps, especially if you're targeting a very country specific. And I imagine it'll get even more specific. I would think Australia might be next. They're the next biggest market. So look at those two things. And I'm going to say one more thing that I think is really good before, even before you get to that point on your website, you're creating content. That's really where you're going to send people. And so you generally have an idea of what you're already talking about anyway. So if we're creating a post or we're creating a product listing, do all of that first and then go to Pinterest and search the same keywords you're using in your blog post and just make sure they're in alignment and see if maybe there's a little bit of tweaking. So this whole, you don't start with the search on Pinterest, especially if you're a content creator, you really just affirm the search on Pinterest with those methods. Mm, I love that. And okay. So you just said something that I know is key. So you create content on your website and you're linking from Pinterest back to your website. And so that's the ultimate goal to drive yes. traffic. So let's talk about that a little bit because from the way I do it is I'll write a blog post or I'll take a podcast episode like this and I'll create a blog post out of the podcast episode. So it's chock full of SEO, right? All these blog posts. But then my Pinterest person who happens to be my mother. Um, oh, yay. I love that. <laughs> isn't that awesome? Mm -hmm. She will then, you know, just break down that blog post and do Pinterest pins. Yes. But the, we link from Pinterest back to that blog post so people mm -hmm. can get more information and then we get traffic to the website. And then there's always a call to action at the end of the blog post, like to download a free lead magnet mm -hmm. um, or, you know, so then we can get their email address and then grow our email list and have take those cold leads to warm leads. So can you talk about that a little bit? And maybe we're missing something in our strategy, but how do you, how do you do that strategy or use that to your benefit? Yeah. You said it exactly as we do it as well. And our goal, actually a second layer of how we map out strategy and what we are, why for using Pinterest is we use it to grow our email list. That's our number one goal. And so we do the same thing. We take our podcast, we convert it to a blog post that is heavily SEO because Google is our number one goal. Pinterest is our second goal. YouTube is one of our third and then Facebook, Instagram kind of follows a deep, deep, deep down there. So we take and then create two to three images per post. And then we have the call to action at the end. We have very clear lead them towards our email lead magnet. We pin those to Pinterest with very much the same keywords. And we add those to boards on Pinterest that also match those keywords. So if I'm talking in that podcast about Pinterest marketing for Shopify store owners, I'm going to make sure that I pin it to a board that has to do with e-commerce so that once it's pinned, Pinterest will very clearly know what that pin is about. So as you said it, you're doing great. But a lot of people miss this piece is they think about Instagram first, because that's generally what we go towards. And then they forget to create a Pinterest image. And then they get to this position where they're like, oh, can I just repurpose it from Instagram and just put it up on Pinterest? And that's where I think a lot of people, they're either fatigued with content creation, they're fatigued with social media, and they just do that. But they have to remember that, that nobody knows the context of an Instagram image, which is why we add text to a Pinterest image. Because people on Pinterest unlike Instagram, they don't read below in the description. They only have a snapshot of what's in that image. They want a quick poppy statement, click, and then go to learn more. They are primed to move off the platform, which we're going to talk about the other way that Pinterest is trying to keep them on the platform with idea pins in just a minute. But you have to remember that they're always willing to read. They're not, Instagram users don't want to move off. They want to read. They want to consume everything. There's tons of people I follow on Instagram. I've never even seen their website, but every single person that I click on with Pinterest, I expect to go to their website. Mm -hmm. So that's why we really have that thing of really wanting to grow your email list. So how you're doing it. It's great. Oh, awesome. Um, okay. So, oh my gosh, I have, my brain was like <laughs> going 90 miles a minute there. So now I've even lost my, my train of thought, but, um, 
how many do you suggest like a certain number of words or characters? I mean, I know the space is limited, but how much information should we put in the description on mm. a pin? The title's limited. I think it's what, 100 characters maybe? Yeah, it's like 160 then, characters. Yeah. So you have that. But then underneath that is the description. And so mm -hmm. if you're if you're putting in that description and I think it goes up, is it 500? 500. Yeah. yeah. So how many should we fill that up or should we keep it short and simple and then just let them click through to the website? Like how much information should we be giving? Yeah. Great question. So I suggest two to three sentences. I will say at times when I get pretty busy, I just do one sentence. That's a really power packed keyworded sentence, not keyword stuffed, but it's very natural sounding like you would send a text to a friend. And so if you can have it in those two to three, great. I haven't seen to date any advantages going all 500. There was a season of time where people would tell you like max it out. But to be honest, to write out that's that's a lot to write out for the mm -hmm. algorithm. I think enough can happen in three sentences or less. Mm -hmm. I think it too. I think if you give so much information there, they don't have a reason to click to go through over to the website to right. read the full blog post. Well, and to be truthful, nobody does. I mean, that's the thing. Like they're really just looking at the context on the image to connect the dots to say, will this have what I want? Here's a great example. I am planning a trip to Portugal with a good friend and we were sitting across from each other. We share a group board together. It's secret. We were searching on Pinterest, looking for things. And what I'm looking for is, do they have the place? Are they talking about tips? Are they telling me what restaurants to choose from? I'm only getting that context from the image. I didn't even read the description before I went, oh, they're talking about the Douro Valley. Great. Click go. And then I scan through the blog and I think, okay, is this what I want to revisit later? Cause I'm not, I haven't even bought my plane ticket yet. We're just mm -hmm. dreaming. Right. And then I save it to that board so that her and I can revisit it later. Mm -hmm. That's a very common pinner habit. They are planning six to nine months in advance. So that's why your description being maxed out in 500 characters, you're really only writing the description for the algorithm. So if you yeah. have enough keywords in three sentences, great. That's all the algorithm needs. Perfect. Now you talked about like the, the actual pin, the graphic, how many words do you suggest on that? Do you, is it a paragraph? Is it just like one bolded sentence? Like, yeah. what are you suggesting there? Very quick and poppy, just like billboard advertising enough for people to read in less than a second. So Perfect. if you get maxed out with like an infographic, there's really no reason to click. Right. And it's really hard to read. Let's be honest, look at your phone and see what you engage with. That's a number one tip I give people. If you haven't opened the Pinterest app and looked at it and seen what you resonate with, then you're not going to be a great marketer on Pinterest because you're not looking at it through their lens, mm -hmm. but go and spend 10 minutes looking at Pinterest and you can even click on things and save them to a secret board, go back and see what your eye caught, do that same thing, which is a very poppy sentence. Mm -hmm. less, you know, a question clickbait is not the right word, but you kind of get where I'm going with that, which yeah, is yeah. something that intrigues them enough to click. Now, mm -hmm. the only time we say that you should avoid text on your image is if you're in the home decor space and the reason for the, and sometimes a little bit in fashion, because those pinners want to see the whole context of the image. Mm -hmm. So they want to see a living room. They want to see a kitchen because they're trying to conceptualize what theirs will look like. And your text gets in the way. Okay. So part of this strategy then is you create your boards and you have the, like you said, they're kind of like silos of, of content and keywords and key phrases. So if you have boards that are all related to your niche, you can cross post on those boards. Absolutely. How often should you do that? Like if you post on board one today, when is it okay to post that? When is it okay to post that same pin to another board? Yeah. So this number is very fluid for everybody, depending on how much content you have. So if you're a new content creator starting out and you only have 10 pieces of content, well, you're probably going to have to stretch it out. I don't know, maybe like a month apart because you just don't have enough yet where somebody with 300 to 500 can probably go about a week apart. You have to look at your profile and go to other people's profile and how Pinterest shows the pinner when they visit your profile is your most recently saved content. 
So if you're pinning the same thing back to back to back, and that's all somebody sees when they come to your profile, that's not a good user experience. And so there is no algorithm. There's no zing that Pinterest is going to give you if you pin it too close together. You just want to think about a variety going on to the platform. And also when you engage with idea pins, those will fold into those saved ones at the top too, as well. In fact, they'll give preference to those. They'll show those first, but we often recommend a week to two weeks. The other caveat is if you have something that's seasonal. So we advise 45 days in advance before the event. So right now, as we're talking, we've just passed Halloween. We're definitely going into the U S Thanksgiving, Christmas, Hanukkah, other holidays. And so you really want to make sure that you're pinning now because you can't pin Christmas content in April. Right. Right. So you might put that a little bit closer together, but just make sure again, it looks like it's a variety. Mm, Love that. Okay. And how many pins do you suggest people do a day? Again, super fluid. We just did an interesting study in my account because we wanted to kind of challenge this. And we just picked an arbitrary number of like 20 pins per day. We were doing five to seven. We don't have a final conclusion yet, but we really wanted to see, did that affect us positively or negatively for us? It did give us a slight bump, but I don't think we could sustain it for a long time because we only have about 300 pieces of content. So you have to think about that too. It's not so much the volume, but it's more, are you, I would rather tell somebody to do less five to seven per day than 20 really, for lack of a better phrase, crappy pins that you've Mm -hmm. just thrown up there for the sake of a number. And I think people really get caught up in that. So somebody who's like a food content creator, who's been creating content for 10 years, they have thousands. They can sustain 20 to 30 per day, especially during the holiday season, because that's when they get the majority of their traffic. So you have to look at those variables too, before you set your number. But I would advise everybody to start between five to seven. If you again, are that person that only has 10 pieces of content, you might only do one to two. You're not missing out. If you don't do more, you can start to create more images for one particular post or landing page that can definitely stretch out your content. So when you're testing these things for your own account, you have to remember keywords make a difference. Niche makes a difference. Images make a difference. There's so many variables that that's the advantage that I have in working for so many different accounts is that I can't take somebody who sells fishing guides and overlay the same strategy with a content creator who does everyday food, right? Because Mm -hmm. the everyday food is going to get traffic much faster and much quicker than the fishing guides, right? Because it's right, so much more right. niche. So you always have to compare your numbers to your niche, never to the niche of somebody else. Mm, that's a great point. Now you just mentioned hashtags again. So what hash, how many hashtags should we be? Using? Zero, 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 zero. P- hashtags it. is not the place for Pinterest. They've been very confused over the years. Mm-hmm. They introduce them, they pull back on them. Users on Pinterest, they don't even use hashtags. They don't search in hashtags. They don't click on hashtags. Just And they, a lot of people will replace a keyword for a hashtag like they do on Instagram. Just forget they ever existed on Pinterest. Oh, I love that. I love that because we we used to use them because, you know, I don't know, mm-hmm. a while ago it was like, oh yeah, use like 10 or whatever the number was. And then it was like, oh, just use three. And I'm like, why are we even doing this? It's so much extra time to do hashtags. Yeah. So that's that's super awesome. Okay, let's talk a little bit about idea pins mm-hmm. versus pin pins. <laughs> yeah, okay. So idea pins are the hybrid between an Instagram story and a reel and a TikTok. It's like all those three had a baby. And The whole goal was Pinterest in 2020 obviously saw the rise of TikTok and the ability that Reels and TikToks had to keep people on the platform longer. And as we just talked about, that's the pinner habit is to leave the platform. That doesn't work so well if you're trying to monetize through ads. And so Pinterest had to create a vehicle that could keep people on the platform longer and hold their attention. And their solution was they created, originally it was called story pins. Mm -hmm. And they realized that was too confusing because it sounded like Instagram. So then they went to idea pins and it's like, it's broken out into slides. So think of it like micro content. So if you have recorded this podcast, you've done a blog post and there's four high level things that you want to call out in an idea pin, you would create a title slide, the four ideas and a closer slide. You can do both static images and video in there as well. 
and people can save those. They don't click to your website. They only ha have a call to action to go to your profile and then people will click on your link and they'll go to your website. So we use these as supplemental micro content once or twice a week. That's what we recommend. You don't have to do them every day. You, we've tested doing every day and it's exhausting <laughs> to create these because you're creating the images, you're creating the storytelling, you're, cre you're creating all of those things and they're just really difficult. So when we look at how to leverage both standard regular pins and idea pins, it's like idea pins supplements the standard pins and allows you to connect with the pinner in a different search because Pinterest might show that content to them in a different search. And you might have somebody who engages with the idea pin, but they never saw your standard pin. So we just think of it as diversity. Like you're able to create a different type of pin format for your content, but think of it like micro content. I love that. So do you, in the description on the idea pins, do you put the URL there so people can see it or you don't even waste time putting the URL there? Um, this has been a debate. <laughs> so I will say this, uh, Pinterest, Number one complaint before they added idea pins from regular users was that pins didn't link. It was like this most frustrating thing when you found this amazing shirt that you really loved and you click on it and it was dead, right? Because somebody just uploaded it and forgot to link to something. So then Pinterest added idea pins and they don't link and you further exasperate this particular frustration for the regular user. New accounts, we have some clients who have it, actually do have the ability to link idea pins. They are testing it. Now, those who don't have the ability to link, some will put it in the list. Now, this is a debate. This is not something that I have an opinion on. It is a little, it's very much Pinterest says, just list the things that they need. They would tell you, they would not endorse it. So we're just going to, you're just going to take that with a grain of salt, right? So you can try it, but my recommendation is that you call to action people to follow you and on the analytic stats of an idea pin, you can see how many follows you got and you can see how many profile visits you got. Mm. So then a lot of the clicks then will come through the link in your profile and they'll come to your website, which is why I always recommend if you're going to lean into idea pins, your website needs to have a clear place where they can search because they're going to land on your homepage and they're going to be really curious about something but the only way they're going to find it is with the search on your website. So it's up for debate. It could open to everybody having links on idea pins. We're just not sure. Okay. So now I have one more question. Um, when you are creating pins, so like we use Canva to create our pins. Yes. Um, you have an option to name your pin. Mm -hmm. Is yes. that a good idea? And do you put a keyword key phrase in the name of the pin? In the name of the pin in Canva, in right? Canva. Yeah, yeah I would say idea? I would say it's more a good idea for your SEO practice, right? Because we want to name our images for SEO. I it's up for debate whether or not that really makes a different with difference with Pinterest. Really, where that's going to make the most impact is with your idea pin. You're going to be asked about the title again, the description, and you can add tags. So those tags are really like those keyword phrases. I believe you can add up to 20. So that's really going to get the most impact. So do whatever's first and foremost for SEO. That's what we do because we know that we want to name the images when they're uploaded to our site so that Google knows what it is. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's what we do too. Um, oh my gosh. Okay. So we covered, oh no, there's one more thing. Share <laughs> threads, share threads. Oh. Oh, um, that's funny. You should go to our Instagram today. Does that go to, we did a funny reel about that. Okay. So share threads really rose in popularity when there was a belief that engagement, like that you could elevate engagement kind of artificially, right? Mm -hmm. The problem in the breakdown is that the whole idea of these is reciprocity, I share for you because I really care about your business and you share for me because you really care about my business. Well, the problem is, is we're not in the same niche. So your content on my board doesn't make sense mm -hmm. because I'm targeting people with Pinterest marketing. So then I, if I'm not truly supportive, would put it on a junk board that has no advantage for you. And the junk board has no advantage for me. So the only time I recommend both group boards or share threads is if you're in the same niche with people. So sometimes it does work for our food content creators because they're in alignment of what they talk about. Now, I'm never going to match somebody who 
does like bon appetit or really extensive recipes that people geek out over matched with the home cook because those are mismatched. Right. Right. So, um, while people think they work, we have seen them only work in those instances when the niche is most closely aligned. It's, it's really a waste of time. I don't do them at all. Okay. So that's how I feel about it. And then what about ads? Like, is there weight to Pinterest ads and should we be Mm. considering those over like a Facebook ad or an Instagram ad or a LinkedIn ad? Yeah. You shouldn't consider them over, but in complement of. So there's two things that you need to think about with Pinterest ads. They take a long time to optimize. We're talking four to six weeks. And so whereas optimization of a Facebook or Instagram ad takes about an hour, you need to allow the algorithm on Pinterest to figure out how it works. So you really don't make any changes to a Pinterest ad for the first two weeks. Now I'll back up and also say you have to have a strategic goal and the goal should be, you want to grow your email list. You want to drive to a conversion or you want to make a sale, never do it for just traffic or affiliate sales or any of those things are not really truly measurable. We also say that Pinterest is good for top of funnel and bottom of funnel. It really doesn't satisfy that middle piece. And that's just because you're building brand awareness on Pinterest people to have that aha moment that you exist. Right. And so while you can target that warmer audience with that bottom, you really need to understand that you are looking for cold leads on Pinterest. It's your cold lead generator and it's just different. Like, you know, we would use Instagram ads and we use Pinterest ads, but our, our intent is very much different. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think it's definitely worth investing We tell people we have a membership around Pinterest ads. We teach people about that. We keep it super low cost because we know that people are going to be spending $25 to $50 a day to try to warm up that pixel over that four to six weeks to see what they want for their conversions. You can do idea pin ads. You can do video ads. You can do standard pin ads. And what we hear from a lot of people is that Pinterest dashboard to figure it out is way easier than the Facebook dashboard to figure it out. I don't know about you, but I don't even want to go into my Facebook ads dashboard because I feel like I'm going to lose my mind. Yeah, so no way. Aww. that being said, you just, it's apples to oranges as Pinterest is organically. It's apples mm-hmm. to oranges with the other platform. We just put it in a different bucket. And if you frame it up that way, you can have really great success with ads. If you know exactly what you want to target. Mm-hmm. Now, what about scheduling on Pinterest? Do you recommend, uh, the only one I'm familiar with as a tool to schedule on Pinterest is Tailwind. Do you Mm -hmm. recommend Tailwind? Mm -hmm. Does Pinterest Mm -hmm. like Tailwind or does Pinterest prefer you just organically post to their platform? No, Pinterest is very API friendly. They highly endorse Mm -hmm. a lot of companies Mm -hmm. later, Planoly, Tailwind, Buffer, Hootsuite, like all of them have the API. Pinterest is really clear about that. There's been several tests. We've done them over the years with the the myth that schedulers negatively impact. Um, And we've seen no difference. So what we tell people is go with the one that you feel like is most productive for you. So we support Planoly and we support Tailwind. Tailwind is changing a little bit from being a comprehensive, just Pinterest and Instagram scheduler into a comprehensive social media scheduler. So there's been some changes there. Um, we're really liking some of the new features on Planoly. They have some idea pin planning tools and research tools also to go along with like TikToks and stuff like that. So met with both teams. They're both great. They're both driven to serve their consumers. So, um, we're big fans of those two. Okay. Awesome. Oh my gosh, Kate, we have like talked about a lot. I feel like the weight in value in value of this show is like immense. Um, <laughs> I know I was taking notes and then I, I like stopped. I'm like, I just got to focus. Right, um, right. Okay. So do you have any last second tips that you want to leave the listeners with? Yeah. I would say if you have not marketed on Pinterest for a while, open your phone and take 30 minutes and just play around with the platform, just engage with it, use it. And that is going to lead you to be a better marketer because a lot of times we're on our computer and we're looking at a big screen and we're looking at a desktop and most of the users are not looking at that. So get on your phone, get on your five inch screen and really see what things look like. 
and think about how you want to connect with your person, search your brand, search your keywords, just do 30 minutes of investigative work. You can even watch TV while you're doing it, but that is such an important step to do. I would say even once a year, if you find that Pinterest is not your favorite, I get it right. But just try to use it because if you don't, then you just will not connect. And if you outsource it, then you don't have to do any of that. You can just outsource it to the people who do it for you. And if you do outsource, be very clear about what your goals are. And that doesn't mean you want to grow by X number of followers, but what your, com- your conversion goals are for it, mm-hmm. because the traffic will ebb and flow on Pinterest. It's no secret that traffic on Pinterest has gone down for everybody. It's gone down for me. Mm-hmm. And that is the nature of most platforms, right? So to just assign to an agency or a virtual assistant, I want to grow by X number of sessions. That's a very arbitrary goal because you don't know when your seasonality is. You don't know when your high searches are like, it would be like me saying, somebody saying to me, like, um, you know, I want all, I want the highest number of sessions right now. Well, I'm a business. I'm a B2B I'm competing against holidays. That's unrealistic. Right. So really be clear about your goals and be confident in the person that you've hired and check in with them once a month, they should be checking in with you once a month. So those are just something to think about. And when you talk about that and working with someone else, so there are analytics, Pinterest, or yeah. Pinterest has a lot of analytics Pinterest and in the Google. back end. What are some of the, yeah, Google as well, of course. Um, what are some of those analytics that people should focus on? Probably not follower count because mm-hmm. just Correct. because you have a follower doesn't mean that follower is going to convert, but clicks and um, likes, all those kind of things. But I'm thinking click throughs are the ones that are the stats that are most important to look at. Yeah. There's nine points in there of data that you can look at. Now, some are arbitrary and I don't even know why they have them in there. That monthly viewer number on your profile, that is one that we never use. I know it makes people feel good. And if you're working with brands, I know that they will care about that. But if you're not working in with brands, don't worry about it. Look at clicks, looks at saves, saves, Mm -hmm. um, signal future intent, And then you can look at impressions, but you also want to know that like when you're on your phone, if you're looking on the left, but your pin is on the right, you still got an impression if you are on the right, but I didn't actually see it, but you want to kind of take stock of that and look at that and see, well, I, it means I'm coming across a screen somewhere, even if someone didn't see it. So looking at those pieces, click through rate, and then you can drill down to video. You can drill down to idea pins. You can drill down to boards with the most engagement. Yeah. In addition to that 30 minutes of just playing around, look at your analytics to see what's in there to kind of try to gauge it, but only do it once a month. Don't do it every day. That will drive you crazy. (laughs) Absolutely. That would drive you crazy. All right, Kate, how can the listeners connect with you, learn more from you? Yeah, there's one way, Simple Pin Podcast. People are already listening to this podcast. So go over there to Simple Pin Podcast and subscribe. And then If you want to see what we're doing on Pinterest, just to kind of like frame up, you can go to pinterest.com slash simple pin media. It's all one word. And you can see a little bit of how we're repurposing our strategy with Instagram and TikToks because a lot of people ask us about that. So you can see that over there as to how we're trying to, to leverage that whole grandiose stream of repurposing that everybody has. Yes, yes, absolutely. I know that I've done that. I have actually been off of social media since September. Mm. I go in now periodically just to engage, but I have not posted Mm -hmm. except a couple of stories. So I'll be back um, eventually, but I just took some time off to focus on other things, but that's what we would do. I would create a month worth of content and then, you know, the, the comments, everything were in Canva. So all mom had to do was resize and copy and paste and it worked great, but she's like, when are you going to do that again? (laughs) (laughs) She's like, I need some content. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, that's the beauty of Canva, right? We can copy and and resize. Um, Love, love, love. All right, Kate, this has been fabulous. Thank you so much for your time, your energy, and all of the just amazing tips that you gave us today. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for having me.